What? It's been a long time since I've talked to you. And I mean, I, I like, mean, like this. Yeah. Um, what have you learned about Jesus or God, or what? What's on your mind? What's on your heart? What do you? Have you learned anything new? I mean, because you always, I, mean, I tell everybody, I don't know anybody, anybody really, especially your age, who uh, gets more out of that Bible. And you like the message too, right? The message oh, I love the message. Too. I mean, you, the last two series I've been using the message, just every verse almost. Yeah. Um, what have I learned since the last Lord, time we talked like this? What do you, Lord, 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 so much I know. What do you, what, like first, what are you teaching right now? What is I heard uh, you did a good sermon, Marcy said, English. On relaxing? Or uh, on, yeah. Look, uh, is, come, yeah. Are you tired and worn out? Burned on the run. Learn the unforced rhythms of grace, that one. This series uh, is, I think I titled it, or at least subtitled it, It's Not As Hard As You Think It Is. Just talking about spirituality in general. And I'm covering things like, um, you know, the biggies like prayer, um, Studying the Bible, you know all those big holy things that have well, been let's so take daunting. One first, prayer. To, to me, prayer is, you know, I think I understand now, at fifty-four this month, that when Paul says pray without ceasing, I think I now know what that means. You're just continuing. You know, I, I I talk to him all the time, right? Isn't you don't have to be on your knees and. I think you're always aware of his presence. Mm -hmm. That's like when I sit down with people like this and do counseling sessions or whatever, pastoral settings. We, we get to the end of 30 minutes or an hour or two hours together and, and, and I close and sometimes I'll look at them and I'll say, Amen. Oh. And they'll be like, are, are we going to pray? And I'm like, we just did. We have that. And but it, it almost is demeaning to the idea of what we're doing in that holy setting for me to we talk an hour and a half about something that's so central to their soul. Right. Their heart breaks, their hopes, their pain. We do all of that, and then we get there and say, let's talk to God now. Mm -hmm. I'm like, was he not in this conversation? Mm -hmm. So I just say amen because that was a prayer. You know, Isaiah 58, um, the people had stuff like prayer, attendance to, you know, temple, fasting, all that stuff. They had it down. Isaiah 58, God said, you know the fast You know the fast that I want from you? Take some of your food and give it to hungry people. I'm not worried about one day, three day, seven day, 40 day. I'm not worried about Daniel fast, vegetables, starches, you know what. He said, the real fast that I want, the one from your heart, share your food. So if you take that and say, maybe he would say something like he said in the Sermon on the Mount. He said, one way of praying for forgiveness is the end of the day prayer we used to grow up praying oh god please forgive me if i did anything today i can remember some but if i can't remember it please forgive me even for that bring it to my mind so i can confess remember that begging he said um you want to be forgiven by god you want that prayer to work he said just live your life forgiving people so so the daily life of forgiving others is the prayer to god for our own forgiveness and so I went through, you know, when we all began kind of the journey theologically of expanding and trying to open up our minds, it so addled me in my perspective of God and things like prayer. I went into this period that I thought was a prayerless phase. Mm -hmm. Six or eight years, I didn't know how to pray, didn't know who I was praying to, didn't know why. You know, like Tony says, why am I supposed to tell God that Sister Gladys is in room 313? Right. Doesn't he know? You know, all those big... <laughs> All those big problematic ideas. Yeah. I, it so paralyzed me that I couldn't pray. And so I get to the end of that phase and and I look back on it and in retrospect I called it the prayerless phase. But the more I look back on it, I, I think I was praying all the time. Mm -hmm. It wasn't the prayerless phase. It was a phase when I think I, for me, learned what prayer really was as opposed to the formal. I, I, was, I was praying all the time in my prayerless phase. Were you pastoring during that prayerless mm -hmm. phase? Did Which is a little problematic to be a pastor that doesn't pray. But Yeah. Well, you, but now you realize you were. I was. But the time, did you think you were becoming you know, I've heard you say you're a Christian agnostic. Mm -hmm. Which I love. Because uh, I believe that's true. That you, Basically we, I, we believe a lot but we know nothing. Right. right? Did you think you were leaning more towards um, that there might not be a God at that time? 
you know, I, 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 I was a genuine to the the phrase Christian agnostic. I got that from a, a Presbyterian minister named Don McCullough. Used to be the head of San Francisco Theological. Good guy. Wrote a book called Trivialization of God. And I think Don is the one. I think he used the phrase reverent agnostic. A oh, reverent agnostic. You know, there are agnostics who are kind of dissidents, thumbing their nose at the thing, and they're kind of angry mad. Right. I wasn't angry and mad. I was sad. I was clawing the slide of the slippery slope trying to hang on. Trying to get back to it. Oh, I, I missed. I missed. I do what I missed. I didn't miss God looking back as much as I miss certainty. Oh, wow, that's true. I missed having the answers on something really important because there's real comfort in that. we grew up with everybody. They had the answers, those pastors. That was so comforting. Yes. We knew that everything was all right. And when I began to lose the answers, that was the discombobulating. Okay. That was the thing that was really discomforting. And then... I told somebody that here's a great picture of that period. I grew up on what I thought was the top of the mountain of God. And I know you got ADD, so that you got to follow me on this metaphor. Right. So there was this mountain called the mountain of God, and my people, my little denomination, That's we true. were the last of the Mohicans of Revelation. And we were on the top of the mountain. It was like the moon. We had planted our flag there. And we were looking down the mountain trying to get all the other folk up the side of the mountain. One day, the cloud cover above me that I thought was the heavens, it began to clear. Turned out it was fog. And it turned out I wasn't on the top of the mountain. I was on an outcropping about 30 feet up the side of the mountain. <laughs> There's a bigger mountain here. <laughs> and I looked up. And the real mountain went as far as I could see into the distance. And then I started looking around. When the cloud cover cleared, I looked around, and there were people all over the side of the mountain with flags. With flags. <laughs> That's great. And it so threw me off. Now, here's what I did. It so threw me off that we were all pathetically in kind of that same humble position Lots of them still had cloud cover and they couldn't see anything except, you know, their place. I literally fell off of my outcropping and rolled down the hill. Mm. That's what happens. You go, mm. uh, Walter Brueggemann in his commentary on the Psalms, you know, he talks about there's naive orientation, then there's disorientation, and then there's reorientation. Mm. And the disorientation, I, I fell down the mountain. Mm. The 30 feet that I thought was... 30 miles on the top of the mountain, I lost even my 30 feet. Mm. And I got down to the bottom of the mountain, and like a fool, because I thought the goal was to be to the top of the mountain, mm -hmm. like a fool, I started scrambling, trying to get back up the mountain. Got it. I started, whoever at the base of the mountain said they could get me to the top of the mountain, whether it was the Calvinists or the Armenians, the Catholics, the Anglicans, whoever it was, I, I would hire, I, I would hire them. And, and I kept trying to re-ascent the mountain. And I didn't get any, you know, I didn't get, I, I, I did in that phase get a little farther, I thought, up various sides of the mountain. I did put a few more flags on the mountain, but every time I'd roll back down. Where I live now is I have not walked away from the mountain. I live now at the base of that mountain in a humble tent. Mm. And I do stuff like this. This is mountain climbing. Mm -hmm. I love mountain climbing. Let's put our gear on. Let's climb up the side of the yes, mountain. Let's have no false illusions that we're going to get to the top. Yes. My life, your life doesn't depend on us getting to the top. At the end of the day, after we've hiked a long way up, been exhilarated, you know, seen a few birds we hadn't seen down there, yeah. saw a couple of rainbows, let's pack our stuff, go back down to the bottom of the mountain and live humbly. It's beautiful down here. Relax. Yes. There's a lot of water that flows off that mountain. Oh, There's a lot of green pasture yeah. at the base of that mountain. And now, you know, I love mountain climbing as a hobby, but most mostly I just come out of my tent, look up at that mountain, put my hand over my mouth and put my hands up and say, this is bigger than I, I love am. love that metaphor. 
So, no, 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 because I was raised independent Baptist, I now have to dissect the metaphor. Mm -hmm. Is the mountain God? It's the mystery, the mystery of the mystery of I think all things. The mystery of the universe. The mystery of creation. Certainly, that includes the mystery of the Creator. Where do you think Jesus lived? Uh, I, me, I'm I'm pretty creedal in that in my heart. I think. He came down from the top of the mountain. <laughs> yeah, I did too. <laughs> I think he went back to the top of the mountain. Yeah. And I think one day we'll all get to the top of the mountain. Oh, and won't it be a view? Mm -hmm. That's what I love about you, that you've not given up on Jesus. I'm telling you, I have had to let go of a lot of things that at the time I thought were as important as Jesus. Mm -hmm. But when you let them go... You know, but through all the baggage, there's been that one red thread of truth that I think is truth, which is Jesus. Yeah. That I, I can't, not that I can't let him go. He won't let me go, I believe. That's good. That's the way I feel. Yeah. Yeah. I, uh, Beekner said, maybe the miracle of it all is that I've waited on the vindicating miracles to prove the thing and they've never come. Maybe the miracle is, he was 43 when he wrote this, I'm 44. He said, maybe the miracle is that I keep reaching my hand into the dark. Maybe the miracle is that I, who might not have been, am and cannot give the thing up and am not given up by it. Maybe the miracle is I keep believing I can't let it go. And I think the reason we can't let it go isn't sentimentality or even sociology because we've let a lot of that stuff go. And I think I think I let go of Jesus. You did. I did let go of Jesus. Um, I had to. When? Back, Back during that, day, that period. Time. I let go of him, but I really did believe that at the same time I was letting go of a lot of things. I let go of them not to lose them. I let go of them to see if they were real because if they were real, they didn't depend on me holding them. Oh, isn't that the truth? And all the stuff that I let go of that wasn't real, it evaporated. I let go of him and me holding him didn't have anything to do with him being there. And then after a long time of letting go and him not leaving, I decided he must be real. I have a friend who's going through that right now. Um, he claims now to be an atheist. And I just, you know, I didn't know how to respond. He texts me, which I hate texts. You know, I, mm -hmm. I, it's just so impersonal. And he's telling me that through a text. And, and what I, you know, I, I wanted to say, but he hasn't quit believing in you. But that, that is such a cliche at a time like that. What do you tell someone I'm, in that period? Or what do you do for a friend in that period? Uh, it doesn't... You know, the old joke is atheists don't believe in God and I don't believe in atheists. God doesn't believe in atheists? Yeah, yeah, I don't believe in atheists. Oh, atheist. you don't? Okay. I, I think there are a lot of hurt people. I think there are a lot of people who... I mean, to uh, honestly, technically, to be an atheist, you have to know that there is right. no God. Well, that's an incredible leap of faith. Yeah. That's as big as believing there is a God. Yeah. Most of our friends who say they're atheists are really technically saying they're agnostics. Right. They've, But nobody told them all they had to do was believe. Everybody told them they had to know in their mind. Mm -hmm. And when they can't know, they think that detaches them. Yeah. There's no room for doubt. There's no room for uncertainty, you know. But when I have a friend going through that phase, um, I'm pretty sympathetic, empathetic. I went through that. Right. And it's dark, isn't it? But nobody could have helped me skip a step. Yeah. But the friends who didn't try to fix me, mm -hmm. but respected my journey mm -hmm. and let me take it, they were my, my best friends. During, it was hard enough without having people piling on trying oh, to fix it. I know. So man, and you I don't want to fix, fix it. You know, that's the initial thing. Oh, please don't, don't do this. Don't go here. But you're right. We're all on our own journey. And, and but you know, I love what I love what in John, uh, I believe it's John nine. Uh, Karen Peck Gooch on Social Camp did a devotion this morning on John nine, and I love it. I love this too. Where 
where Jesus says, are you going to leave me too? Mm -hmm. And Peter says, where are we going to go? Who else has the words of life? You know, that you're, we believe you're the son of... That's a great line. Isn't that a great... Where are we going to go? It's not... It's See, that's not the resounding answer that some people would want. Well, of course we're not going to leave you. Because we're absolutely certain. Right. I mean, that's what we want people to say. Peter's... I mean, the thing that had happened there was Jesus, big crowds following, it was actually John 6. Oh, it's John 6. Not to be a smart, self-righteous preacher. But, <laughs> and big crowds following. And so there's these huge crowds, and Jesus turns around and says... You like all of this? This bread breaking, fish feeding, all that stuff? You like all that? He says, I'm the bread of life. Except you eat my flesh. Now, we're listening through 2,000 years of orthodoxy. Sure. They're, they're hearing cannibalism. Right. Unless you eat my flesh and drink my blood. Yeah. I don't know if there were vampires back then, but that's, that's pretty inflammatory. Yeah. So he says that, and the Bible says from that moment, many of his disciples began to go back and walk no more with him and instead of screaming and hollering and say you can't leave me he let, he let them have their journey guarantee you a lot of them came back around before their life was done mm -hmm. but instead of that he turned to his disciples and he said will you also go away and the point is that they didn't say well of course not we know exactly what you're talking about it's the Eucharist it's communion a little while you're going to die and from the next 2,000 years we're going to take bread you know, unleavened bread and wine and we're going to remember you they didn't have any more clue of what he was talking about than the ones who walked away and Jesus didn't tell them either if he didn't knew, explain I it I presume he knew of course he <laughs> probably knew but but Peter it was one of those not resounding faith decisions but default faith decisions and that's not good enough sometimes for the church but it was good enough for Jesus by default, resounding would have been, well, of course, this is what you... Default was, we're just as confused. We don't have any more idea. It sounded like cannibalism and vampires to us, too. But where else would we go? I mean, where else would we go? We don't know everything. We don't have clarity. But we have this intuitive sense that there's something beneath all this uncertainty that's real. And that was, I mean, that's what, I, that was me. And then he goes on to say, because uh, we believe that thou art the Christ, right? The Son of the living God, too? Is that where that happens? No, that's What else that's did he later. say past John 6? Uh, yeah. There was something else that she brought up, and where, where he, he says, where is it where he says the Spirit, has, is, was that in the boat? The, the God, uh, the Spirit revealed that to you, Peter? Oh, that's Matthew 16. That Matthew 16? Mm-hmm. Well, Peter goofed up a lot, but he did some good things. <laughs> you know, he got some things right. I mean, like one thing that's always confused me about him is he walked on water with him. Okay? I mean, that's a big deal. Hmm. And then he denied him. I mean, once I'd walked on water with somebody, I would think this it must be somebody. This is the real deal, right? I mean, I've never walked on water with him. And I tell my, you know, my crowd, say, go easy on yourself when you're having doubts because Peter walked on water with him and he must have doubted even after that all the way we haven't had that experience but when when he met with them at the mountain uh, before he ascended he met with the 12 mm -hmm. or the 11 mm -hmm. he met with the 11 and scripture says and when they saw him they worshiped him and they doubted it does that's the 11. That's the guys who get through the sift of the whole thing. Yeah. They get down to the end, and after 40 days, he's about to ascend. And when they saw him, they worshipped him, and they doubted. In the same sentence. Unreal. Yeah, I can live with that. Lord, I believe. Help my unbelief. Yes. Go to the back of the line. No, Jesus says, that. Mm, good enough. That'll work. <laughs> That'll work for me. <laughs> I love one thing when I was going to church here that you said about, um, uh, oh gosh, don't turn 54. It just left my mind. I bet it was good, though. It was good. I bet it was. Uh, we'll edit that out. <laughs> <laughs> oh, crud. Well, 
Oh, he'll we'll come to He'll come back. Okay, so, Peter, let's talk about Peter a little bit. I, oh, I, I know one thing, when you said, get thee behind me, Satan. Remember yeah, that? yeah, get between. He was getting between. That's a great, I mean, that's a great story. Who do you, who do men say that I am? Mm -hmm. that's, that's where it was, yeah. Some say you're the Christ, some say you're Jeremiah, Elijah, one of the prophets. Um, good. Who do you say I am? Two-question test. I, I heard no preacher years ago say, I hated two-question tests because if you get one right, you still failed. Oh, yeah. 50 wasted points. Right. you got to get both. Who do men say that I am? Which is critical. You know, people say, well, I don't care. I've got my own thing going with Jesus. No, we live in community. Let all prophesy. Let the others judge. This is a big community of people. And we need the democracy of the ages and lots of voices speaking in our life. Jesus didn't go straight to, who do you say that I am? He said, who do men say? It's important hmm. who our Catholic brothers and sisters and Pentecostal and Methodist brothers and sisters say he is. Mm -hmm. On top of that, it's also important, equivalently important, who do you say I am? Thou art the Christ, Son of the living God. Jesus says, flesh and blood didn't reveal that to you, Simon. In other words, he said, I know you too well. You could not have come up with that by yourself. Wow. So he didn't give him credit for this huge revelation. Right. Immediately after that, the Bible says Jesus began to explain to them how he needs to go to Jerusalem, mm -hmm. suffer many things, and Peter rebuked him. Yes. Immediately, Peter rebukes him, and Jesus says, get behind me, Satan. So in the same five-minute section, there's, thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. Wow. Flesh and blood hadn't revealed this. Upon this rock, I'll build my church, and I'll give you the keys. Yeah. Turns right around. In five minutes, he says the smartest thing he'd ever said and the dumbest thing he'd ever said. <laughs> and neither time did grace give him full credit for either. When he said the great thing, Jesus said, you didn't get that all by yourself. My Father revealed that. When he said the awful thing, Jesus didn't say, get behind me, Simon Peter. Jesus said, get behind me, Satan. Which the old word picture is, if you're telling Satan to get behind you and you're Jesus, then you're positioning yourself between Simon and Peter. He didn't get full credit for the good stuff, and he didn't get full credit for the bad stuff. Oh, well, how nice. Yeah. I take that. But that that's the deal. We're, we're, not the, we're not angels or demons. Yeah. You know, C.S. Lewis said, when you cease making people gods, they'll cease being demons. Say that again. When you cease making people gods, okay. they'll cease being demons. Oh. We're not quite that good, yep. and we're not quite that yeah. bad. We're all you know, yeah. created in the image of God. Bill Gaither's dad said, you know, it probably wasn't that good, the good as you thought, and it wasn't that bad as you thought. It wasn't your best day, your worst day. Yeah. Well, all right, what else? I should have written down a bunch of questions. Um, um, well, what have you been doing? What are you, ta are you talking about? Oh. Are you talking about anything new? Or are you just going into the sunset using all that old golden material? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you got um, it on autopilot. Uh, pro pretty much. No, I'm, uh, I just, what I'm doing, I just did a love song CD. Unforgettable. Old songs. Did you really? Yeah. The last two days. Unce, Tice, Feet Time, Billy. It was my bucket list. Was it really? Yeah. What songs did you Fly like? Me to the Moon. Oh, like classics? Yeah. Standards? Yeah. Tony Bennett, Perry Como? Yeah. And, jo and, and Jeff Easter's on Social Cam. I said, what does Mark Lowry know about love? Uh, and I said, well, I don't know anything about it, but I, I know very little about God, but I sing about him. <laughs> <laughs> But um, so that's what I'm doing. And I may I may stage that a few places with a combo band and stuff. It's just for fun. Um, I'm just trying to tell people God's crazy about them. That's basically my thing. And also, I, I I've been thinking about parents. You know, because if anybody should get the love of God, it is a parent, a healthy parent. Because I, me not having children, I should have a better excuse not to get it. Because parents have this connection, you know, uh, like this one guy said at um, Praise Gathering, an Episcopal, not Praise Gathering, Family Fest. Oh, Ian Crone? Episcopal guy. Mm -hmm. yeah. About beholding. There's a difference between looking and beholding. 
at your child, you know, in your arm and mm -hmm. was a baby. And, um, but what I, um, like, I, I, if I was a parent and I was walking down the hallway of my home and I heard my children arguing in the room and I put my ear to the door and they were arguing about how they could be more like me. And they were all getting it wrong, but one got it close. Would I kick out the ones who got it the least? And you being evil, know how to give good gifts, how much more? And um, basically trying to say that it's a broken image of, your love for your child is a broken image of what I think the Father's love is for us. I think one of the questions that's troubled us for a long time in conservative, whether it's Catholic or Protestant, one of the things that's troubled us is who are the children of God? Who, who actually meet the criteria to be treated like children of God? Are there, uh, are there people in this world who are children of God and people in this world who aren't children of God? That's a biggie. Well, of course, when we raised, yes, right? Right, yeah. Unless you've invited Christ into your heart, you know. The first birth, all right, let's, let's talk about some edgy stuff here. Okay. The first birth made you a child of the world, of the world system, right? Mm -hmm. John even uses some pretty strong language in his epistle that there are children of God and there are children of the devil mm -hmm. so so not everyone can claim the love of a child from a parent and the parent being God not everybody can claim that God is there so the question I guess better stated would be every human being who's born in this world can we claim for that newborn baby that they're a beloved child of God so, some say no, you can't. All right, a, a, a text, John 3. Jesus said, you must be born again. again. The second birth is what makes you, some would say, a child of God. They're really taking that metaphor technically and saying you're not a child of God until you're born the second time. And that's a birth of the Spirit that takes conscious faith. Um, that's what you believe Jesus meant there? No. Now, what do you believe Jesus meant there? when he said you must be born again? I, I personally believe that birth of the Spirit is a spiritual awakening. Mm -hmm. And I, I would probably say that that metaphor means that we are to be born again and again and again and again and again. Born again and again and again and again. And again. Well, that's very Pentecostal. Baptist is once saved, always saved. Yeah, but I, I don't <laughs> even see that as salvation. Yeah. Jesus said you must be born again to see to enter the kingdom to get the kingdom okay I, I get that I totally agree with what he's saying there the question is what's he saying there what, whatever he's saying what I he agree mean? with it. what did he mean because other times he took children who hadn't been born again right. pull them up his lap and said don't mess with these in one particular occasion, the children were coming to Jesus, and the Bible says the disciples shooed them away because they thought with their perspective on the kingdom that that was a distraction to the important stuff he was trying to do. Scripture said he rebuked his disciples and said, don't ever, this is the message, don't ever get between children and me, mm. for such is the kingdom of God. Mm -hmm. And except you see life, the world, God, as they see it, you'll never get the kingdom. And then the Bible says he took them up in his arms and he touched them and blessed them. Okay, who were they? They were children. Were they born again children? Were they children of the world? Did they even know who he was? Did they even know who he was? So, so there, there are scriptures, and this is what I want to uh, say, this is a bigger testimony to some of the, you know, the struggle of biblical interpretation. There are texts that you can build a case that until you do all of the spiritual transformation stuff, you're not on the end with God. Mm -hmm. There are other texts that indicate from the minute you're born, 
you're near the heart of the kingdom. I mean, you could build a case. Where, what scripture? Uh, the scripture that I, I just, yeah. just quoted. Mark 10. About the children. The children. I mean, such is the kingdom of God. Except you become like one of them. They're the model. And you said one time in the sermon about that, you got, it's like a, you got to forget everything you ever knew about God. We're starting with a clean slate. That's yeah. what a child is. Do you remember that? Yeah. Uh, do you still think that's what he meant? I, I think or, it's impossible to forget but I think I think my born again experience was probably that letting go period. I think that's when I really. Well, Paul said we are saved. We are being saved, and we will be saved. Did he not? Mm -hmm. So that that would be. The case. And I feel like when I read the Grace Awakening, it was a salvation experience for me. I feel like when I discovered I was the beloved. It's that, a born again experience. That was another born again experience. You feel like you're it being sure born felt again. like it. Yeah. You remember when I was telling the cashiers? You're the beloved. I, really I, went, I went crazy there for a little bit. I, I, I know. That's a, bit. That's, a, that's a born again experience. That's being born anew. Um, and so, I mean, there's, there's certainly tension there, but. And it would, you know, I, I, hear, the, I hear the voices in my head, you know, cry, uh, well, my, I can hear my mother. We would, uh, now that she has dementia, you know, it's not near as much fun as it used to be. Because she would argue with me, and um, but she said, "He said I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but by me." And it dawned on me one day he didn't say you had to know it. He just said, "I'm the way, the truth, and the life." And if I saw a child on an interstate, I wouldn't walk out and say, "Would you like me to help you off this interstate? Would you? Do you want me to help you? Do you want me to pick you up, a baby?" I'd grab it and run, right? So. Of course, these are arguments, but the scripture, did he, did he say you have to know? And Paul said, you've been worshiping this God, all, you just didn't know his name, remember? Yeah. And so, all right, 1 uh, Corinthians 15, Paul is talking about the resurrection of the dead, and he's really defending the idea that we're going to be resurrected and what the gospel is, the death, burial, resurrection, the fact that Christ was seen, and if Christ be not raised, then we're not going to be raised. And if we're not going to be raised, then Christ wasn't raised. Big point. Right. And then Paul leads into this discussion. He says, for in Adam, remember, in Adam, how many die? All. All. Did, they were condemned by the first Adam before they ever knew it. Yep. Before they were ever born. Yeah. So the first Adam was pretty powerful. This is interesting. If the first Adam is powerful enough to condemn me unconsciously prior to my birth, right? He turns around and he says, "But in the second Adam, in Christ, all shall be made alive." Now, does the all mean something less through the second Adam mm -hmm. than it meant through the first Adam? Uh -huh. And is the second Adam? Jesus less powerful yeah. than the first Adam. Yeah. Now, that's not to say that conscious belief and faith and repentance aren't important things. Of course they're important. But are they the thing that produces our salvation or are they the thing that allows us to fully appropriate and celebrate the fact that we've always been safe? Mm. And maybe that's the ultimate salvation. Mm -hmm. That's smart. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry about that. That is smart. Huh. In, in but that's Christ. true. You can't change the definition of one all or the other all. I mean, all is all. You can't have two different definitions. Uh, we, we do that a lot with words. You know, Romans one twenty seven. Uh, homosexuality is unnatural, mm -hmm. is the word. Interestingly, he uses that that horrible word unnatural one more time in the book of Romans that I that I can remember mm -hmm. for sure. Mm -hmm. You know where he used it? Mm -hmm. He said it's unnatural that the Gentiles would be included. It's against nature. Wow, you're kidding. Mm, same word. Did he he believed that at one time, but he was a big not at that time he didn't What he's saying is what we just experienced with the Gentiles right. is unnatural. Right. It's against nature which is the same word and argument he used when he was talking about homosexuality. It's unnatural. So sometimes, you know, we use words one way in one context and we use that same word, 
but we don't really allow scripture to use it as much as we use it in or we don't use it you know i mean the all to the first adam meant all mm -hmm. the all to the second adam uh we redefine but can you take one scripture it makes me want to be a universalist that verse does it makes me want to believe that really like that guy who wrote the book uh, Rob, Bell. Rob Bell. Love Wins. Love Wins. Have you read it? Mm -mm. it why? Oh, uh, why didn't I? I have a bad tendency that mm -hmm. I love reading obscure things that nobody's reading. Mm -hmm. So when everybody starts reading The Shack or Love Wins, yeah. it's a terrible trait. I'm yeah. not bragging on it, but I don't read what everybody else you is reading. You didn't read The Shack either? I didn't read The Shack. Wow, and I didn't I read Love Wins. Okay. So it's awful. I'll read them when they become obscure. Oh. And then I'll act <laughs> like I have something nobody else has. Um... Oh man. Well, so, but you know, you can't take one verse and build a, build a, mm. uh, a, a denomination like well, Acts two thirty eight is a good one that was built. You know, your people right. took that one scripture and really came up with an entire. Plus Peter, you know, there's a, about being baptized in Jesus' name, and then Baptists. You know, we we've done that too. I just Roman road to salvation, yeah. John three sixteen. Any, yeah, I, I agree. There. But this leads into the the other, you know, the other discussion. I agree that there are scriptures. You know, when I take a hopeful scripture like First Corinthians fifteen mm -hmm. and say this could lend itself. Origen thought this a long time ago. Rob Bell thinks it. Lots of people think it. This scripture in First Corinthians fifteen indicates that maybe. Paul goes on to say, "For when the final enemy death is defeated, well, hell is called the second death. Mm -hmm. Nobody's saying there's not a hell." They're just saying it's a correctional facility, not a penal institution. Hmm. It's a hog pen that wakens people and they want to come home from. That's what George MacDonald, C.S. Lewis leaned that way, I think. Yeah. It's not saying this is what's going to happen. Nobody knows what God's going to do at the end. Right. But is there anything wrong with what uh, Eugene Peterson calls a hopeful theology? I mean, we all are hopeful. You know, when old uncle so-and-so dies and he never went to church and we were always trying to get him to church and we knew he was lost and we treated him like he was lost and he was always going to hell and we loved him, we go to his funeral, within 30 minutes we're sitting there eating banana pudding and mashed potatoes yeah. laughing. I'm like, do we really believe that he's somewhere roasting right now? Yeah. No, we actually, all of us, intuitively have a hopeful theology. That's where purgatory and limbo came from. It didn't come clearly from Scripture, but as Augustine said, we just dealt with the tension that there were some people who were not good enough for heaven, but they weren't bad enough for hell. And limbo was that version of purgatory for babies. We, we couldn't imagine that he was going to burn them forever, but they weren't born again. They were only born the first time. They were born separated from God in sin, shape, and iniquity. So yeah. we could not, so we had a hopeful theology and Protestants say, well, Catholics shouldn't have done that. We did it. We developed something called the Age of Accountability. Yeah, we did. That's, that's Protestant limbo. Yeah. We have no more reason scripturally, technically, to build that case than they did for limbo. But we have all kinds of reasons to do it because we know in our heart that he's not going to be in the business of burning six-year-olds forever. Well, there's one scripture that I think kind of could prove that babies go to heaven. Where King David, he was mourning while the child was sick, but when the child died, he cleaned himself up, went and ate, and they couldn't understand why he was grieving, wasn't grieving. He said, "I can't. He can't come to me, but I will go to him." Well, that's David's perspective. That doesn't mean it's you know, God's I perspective. Said David. Yeah. Oh. Well, oh, well, yeah. we, well, we, we, well, in our, in my world, theology. Hey, the way I was taught is that, you know, what David says is the Word of God. It's all the Word of God. Well, if that's the case, then what Job says is the Word of God. Job said crazy things about God. And when Satan is quoted, that's the Word of God. Yeah, I mean, it's in the Word of God, but, yeah, that's... And a, isn't there somewhere where Paul said, this is not God, this is my opinion? Oh, 1 Corinthians 7, Paul said, this speak I, not the Lord. Yeah. Which has always been odd to me, as we view inspiration. Right. That God inspired Paul to say, this speak I, not the Lord. God said, hey, say this. This speak I, not the Lord. Yeah. Um, so, and what was his point there? Do you uh, it was about divorce, remarriage, all of that. So that was his opinion. Three things he said in 1 Corinthians 7. He said, this speak I, not the Lord. 
another place he said, I say this not by commandment, but by opinion. Oh. And then he closed the whole chapter by saying, and I think I have the mind of the Spirit on these things. There's a humility. I think Paul brought a greater humility to his text than those of us who've interpreted him through the years. Hmm. So, time out. Okay. Sure. We, we always have to be in the process as an effective church of taking stuff off the shelf that was settled in the last generation and reinvestigating it. We can't leave important stuff on the shelf and live vicariously through somebody's decision 1,600 years ago. Yeah. If we do that, we never get past inquisitions, crusades, extreme papal authority, um, slavery, slavery, women's issues, uh, divorces. You know, uh, there's a lot of issues that we settled and we knew we were right on. And Copernicus and Galileo just needed to shut up. But we take it off, and with new lenses, new information, we look at it. We, part of the church's responsibility is to not only do that investigation, but be secure and humble enough periodically to say, we have to shift on this. We don't have to condemn the past, because truth reveals as human consciousness is capable. I don't think we have to look back at Paul and say he was wrong on slavery. I think for first century Palestine, Greco-Roman world, he was cutting edge. It was mm -hmm. as far as the Holy Spirit could take them at that time. Mm -hmm. It's not about condemning the past. It's about appreciating that they were pushing the limits as hard as they could. And we have to continue to listen to that same voice. You know, we have to look at things like inspiration. What's inspiration mean? Does it mean that I look at... Um, my daughter comes to me and says, Hey, Dad... I want you to write a song about me, and this is what I want you to say. Grab a pen and paper. Is that inspiration? Or is inspiration that my relationship with her is so generative and life-giving and powerful that one day I just feel a song flowing out of my heart that I write? She didn't dictate it. She inspired it. Yes. What's, what's the better definition of inspiration? Yeah. Um, I call it hearing from home. Yeah. You know that E.T. thing? When you, you hear something, like when I hear you preach, sometimes it just vibrate because I knew it was true. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. And that's inspiring. That's, that's why people write songs after they hear you and preach. And so was that what the writers, is that when we say the biblical writers were inspired, were they being told to pick up a pen and paper and write exactly this, or were they writing out of that overflow? I was inspired to write that text. I was inspired. What's inspire mean? And then, you know, admitting that there are some truths that can't be articulated with words perfectly. Words point. They don't capture. You, you don't take four letters like L-O-V-E and capture love yeah, any more than my finger captures the sun. It can point to it. You know, that peach cobbler at lunch was great. I didn't give you the experience. I pointed to it, but it's a long way from the experience. Mm -hmm. Words point, and I think Scripture, I think Scripture points like all words, um, but does it fully capture everything that we need? No, I, I, I think it doesn't give us final it fixed points propositional truth. It points to Jesus, and it points to the conversations we're supposed to be having. It may not always give the answers, but it invites us into the right conversation. And the Bible is not the Word of God. It says of itself, Jesus is the Word of God, right? In the beginning was the Word, right. the Word and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, and the Word became flesh. And okay. moved into the neighborhood. <laughs> yeah. Gene Peterson says. The Word became flesh. Okay, so the Word was the body of Christ. And then he transfers, fills us with the Spirit, and says, together, not... Now, you're not the body of Christ. That's, that's heresy. Paul said, together you are the body of Christ. So the Word was made flesh. One person couldn't replace Jesus.
but a corporate group of Nazarenes and Baptists and Anglicans and Lutherans, people from all different places, perspectives, together you're the body of Christ. And that's why Paul said, let all prophesy. Let the others judge. Now I know that scares a lot of people. Listen to what he said. Let all, this is right after the body of Christ thing. Let all prophesy. Everybody is to prophesy. Let the others judge. The ones that aren't prophesying? The community of faith. Okay. You know, Carrie Underwood gets to speak from her heart right. what she thinks is the heart of Jesus. Mm -hmm. Is she right? Paul said, let all prophesy. Right before that he said, for we know in part and we prophesy in part. Our prophesying, you know, I, I run the other way when somebody says, you listen to me, I know I'm right. Oh. No, even we prophesy, we speak for God in part, but the community judges. What do we do when the community judges that she or I or get out? No, we say that's part of the process. And together we're the body of Christ, so the living word of God is the body of Christ. And surely, Scripture is a huge part of that. It's the spiritual travel diary of our forebears. But that living word continues and it flourishes in the body of Christ. Someone says, well, that's, that's too subjective. Well, you think biblical interpretation is not subjective? We have 430 denominations of Baptists, for crying out loud. Oh, wow. Tell me that biblical interpretation is totally objective. Yeah. It's not none of this. But it's okay. We're safe. We're not vouchsafed by certainty and clarity. We're vouchsafed by the Sermon on the Mount. Hungry, thirsty, humble, sincere, meek. You know, people say, Stan, you're relativist. No, I'm not. Okay, what's that mean? Relativist says, oh, here, here's relativist. Bunch of people sitting around the table. You say one plus one equals three. You say one plus one equals seven. You say one plus one equals 15. God bless your heart, you're all right. Oh. No, that's crazy. Or like your per you have your own personal truth. I mean, yeah, your own personal say truth. That or something. Listen, we may not know what one plus one means, but I, I'm not a relativist. Uh, I do believe there's objective truth. I just don't think any of us are completely objective. We are subjects. There's only one objective truth, and that's God. Mm -hmm. And I do believe somewhere God knows what one plus one is. Mm -hmm. And. I, but I don't see God coming down and saying, well, you said it equals three, you said it equals seven, you said it equals 15. Oh, gee whiz, you're all right. Mm -hmm. I see him saying, you said it equals two, you say it equals three, you say it equals seven, or you say seven, four, 15. And God looks at him and says, or he looks at us and says, you know what? You're all wrong. And admittedly, there are some closer than others. But I want to tell you what I really appreciate. I appreciate that you're sitting here at the table doing math. And that's appreciable to me. It's so, that's like the story I, about the, listening at the door of the arguments. Yeah. You know, they're wanting, why are we doing this? Why are we having this today? Because I think, I know for me, I want to know him more. I want to know, because the little bit I have seen is keeps me pressing on. Because it is so lovely. It is so, he is so much nicer than they ever told me. Yeah. And I love him and I want to know him. And I, when I hang around people like you, I, I, I leave liking him a lot better, you know, and loving him. Yeah. And I love that you love to talk about him. Well, John says we love him because we're supposed to. <laughs> we love him because we're, we love him because we're scared not to. You know, all of those things are reasons to say you love him, but they are not reasons to love him. John said, and he was an old man when he said, he said, we love him because there's only one reason, really, he can. He first loved us. He said, well, you're supposed to love everybody and regardless of that. I can love my enemy even if they don't love me because I have the perspective that they're an enemy, they're afraid of human being, and they need my condescension, frankly. Right. They need my grace. He's God. And I expect some things of God. And I, I'll tell you, Mark, I could serve him. I could probably even praise him, thank him. I could do a lot of things in relation to God, but I don't think I could respect, admire, or love him if he didn't 
not just love, first love. If he didn't first love me, I mean, there are people who were birthed by emotionally crippled parents. And there are, there are children who never were loved. Expecting that parent to love that child would be like expecting a person with no arms to hug them. There are some parents who are so crippled by life that they don't have the capacity to love. Somehow, that child grows up with a capacity to love and that child one day faces the pain of recognizing they love a parent that never really even loved them. And there's great pain there. And some, some children can mature and become enlightened enough that they can love that parent. Many can never find a way to love that parent because there was this reasonable expectation that they should have first been loved. And I think we have a reasonable expectation that God would not only love us, but that he would first love us. And John said we love him, and there's only one reason when you really get it. It's because he first loved. And nobody's... It's like with your children. You loved them before they ever even knew who you were, because you saw your image of them, right? I think that's the deal. All right. Well, I know you got to go, and I've enjoyed it. Oh, there's so much more to talk about. If you could talk about one more thing, what would it be? Tensions in Scripture that lead us to not seek absolute resolve, but leave me coming down the mountain, throwing up my hands, putting my hand over my mouth, and just worshiping. Um, you know, I, I appreciate the tradition of salvation by grace, faith decisions, personal repentance that I've grown up in. I, I don't in any way reject that, feel that that's Trump. I think it's a beautiful part of our relationship with God. But I, I also am deeply moved by Matthew 25. I have been in classes before when the teachers were good enough that they said, listen, by the end of the class, here's what you've got to know. This is what the test is going to look like. I don't think I've ever had a teacher say, Here's the exact test, and here's the exact answers. I'm giving it to you from the beginning. Wouldn't we all, you know, some of them will say, here's a sample test. Jesus, in Matthew 25, said, I'm not going to let the apostles do this. I'm not going to let the church do this or archbishops do this. He said, I want to tell you right now, there will be an end day, and people will stand before me, and I'm going to talk to you about what mattered and what affects your eternal destiny. And he says, so listen up, here's what I'm going to say that day. You repented and were baptized. You were born again. August 14th, 1973. Remember the day? June 5th, 1973. <laughs> you, you kept the sacraments. You were dutiful to church. You did confirmation. You know, all the different Lutheran, right. Catholic, Pentecostal way. We cast out none of that. He says, one day you're going to stand before me and this is what I'm going to say. I was hungry, thirsty, stranger, naked, prisoner, sick. And we're going to look at him, all of us who were caught in the multiple doctrines of salvation, and we're going to say, when did we see you? And he's going to say, as much as you did it to the least of these, you were doing it unto me. Enter into the joy of the Lord. And then to really make the point, he's going to say to some others, I was hungry and you didn't feed me. Mm -hmm. Now, that text screams against the part of me that has grown up my whole life saying, we're not saved by works. It's not by works. It's by faith and doctrine and what you believe and getting your ticket punched. And, and I understand that. And I don't think James or Romans cleans this up for us. I think it points to a greater mystery. But I am very much moved these days by the fact that Jesus has already told us what he's going to say at judgment. And I know that that may be bothersome when you compare it with what Paul said between Romans 3 and Romans 6. Um, but... I don't think we can get around the fact. Doesn't he go on to say, depart from me, I never knew you? Mm -hmm. oh. 
See, that's a good case for hell right there. Who, even Origen, who was kind of the inspiration of all that universalism, Origen believed in hell. Okay. Who quit believing in hell? Origen didn't think guys like Hitler were going to put a bullet in their head, wake up, and Jesus was going to say, oh, forget about it. You know? <laughs> <laughs> hey, you, you're going to take your despicableness, your spiritual journey, into the next life. Mm -hmm. The only thing that Origen supposed was that the final enemy death would finally be defeated. That the continuing work, redemptive, curative, purifying work of God would go on even past death. Mm -hmm. And that, again, hell would be that place. George MacDonald, C.S. Lewis's mentor, mm -hmm. he said hell will be that place when people follow their despicableness. They will follow their spiritual loneliness into such a place of utter isolation and darkness that if the worst monster in the world were to come to them there, they would embrace them as friend. Surely in that place of despair, they will come to themselves and like the prodigal say, can I come home? Now, is that the way it's going to be? Well, if I make my bed in hell, you're there. I mean, David said that, right? I don't know. Yeah, I don't know if that's what he's going to do, but there's no reason not to have an imaginative, hopeful theology for the Uncle Buds that we're eating potato salad 30 minutes after we bury them. Yeah. There's no need not to. There are plenty of tensions in Scripture. Those tensions every denomination acts like they resolve them and then we split off with our resolve why don't we just admit the tensions are unresolvable and live humbly with one another and hopefully with one another and hold on to jesus and hold on to jesus hold on to him just keep living down there at the base of the mountain mountain climbing but quit pretending like you got your flag in the top of the mountain yeah isn't it great oh realize, i'm telling you when i found grace he became so much easier to talk about. Yeah. You know, I used to sit by people on planes and think, if I don't witness them, their blood's going to be on my hands at Judgment Day. Well, and maybe it will, maybe it won't, I don't know. But but when I really found grace, it, he became so much easier. It's easy to talk about somebody. You're talking about the unforced rhythms of grace? Yes, yes, yes. Okay, you got to go. That was it. All right. I love you. I love you.